Hello and welcome to this international conference on men's issues interview with your hosts, me, Elizabeth Hobson, leader of the political party Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them, and Mike Buchanan, J4MB's founder. Today's lovely guest is Michelle. I first met Michelle at a non-feminist demonstration outside a feminist event, and I found her to be a sweet, pretty, compassionate, and courageous soul with an interesting perspective. Welcome to the show, Michelle. It's nice to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. That's very, that's very sweet of you. <laughs> um, I think the first time um, that we actually uh, met in person was at Messages for Men in 2018. Uh, and, that, and then it was, uh, I believe, the following March that we met outside uh, protesting the feminist event. <laughs> oh, I do apologise. I, I get all confused with times and dates. But yeah, no, you're, you're quite right, aren't you? Well, it was my, it was my first event, um, first time like attending anything uh, or participating in anything that wasn't online. So, uh, But I'm quite glad that I was there now because... Uh, I can call out a few people who also claim to, to have been there, but we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Michelle, I believe that you were, like Elizabeth there, once seduced by the baseless conspiracy theories, fantasies, lies, delusions, and myths of feminism. What was it, do you think, that appealed to you in feminism? Well... I didn't actually start calling myself a feminist until 2014, but I do think there was a lot of, um, I'd say, preconditioning going on in like the general kind of um, general society and like the environment that I was in. Um, but it was actually after reading Laura Bates's first book, uh, Everyday Sexism, and I still have uh, my copy right here. Um, that I started <laughs> <laughs> yeah and um, so it wasn't until then that I started calling myself a feminist and uh, before then um, I did have a few stereotypes in my mind of what a feminist was and they usually turn out now looking back they turn out to be a slightly true <laughs> And um, so, yeah, it was after reading her book and her book very much encourages particularly young women um, to uh, participate in activism on social media, um, whether that's uh, on Twitter, um, any, anywhere they can find, really. And I slowly started sinking into like an echo chamber and I do the book, honestly, it put me through like an emotional kind of um, conditioning. And now when I, now I'm looking back over it, I honestly think how on earth, how on earth did I fall for this? And it, it really happened during a time where I was socially, pardon me, socially isolated. Um, at the time I was caring for my elderly father and pretty much doing all the day-to-day -day stuff on my own from a very young age. And I didn't have a lot of self-confidence. I didn't have a lot of support around me in general. I came from quite a dysfunctional uh, family. And, you know, all the, all the um, I, I made a few notes as well, because I feel like now I feel like I'm like that person with the red string connecting all the dots, going a little bit crazy, but... It all, it all kind of links together now. And um, looking over everyday sexism, now that I've come out of it, it, it feels like, whether, whether it's intentional or not, it really feels like it's aimed at maybe women and young girls mm -hmm. who have had some uh, traumatic experiences and didn't have the right support around them at the time to feel able to come forward and speak up for themselves and uh, some of the things that had happened to them. And I was, uh, I knew a lot of uh, girls my own age who had also been through abuse and had been ignored or not 
um, supported in the way that they should be. And I re now looking back over the book, I really feel that that is the that is the target demographic really um, to kind of mobilize uh, women who maybe feel that they don't have a voice um, towards the cause of feminism, but then it also conditions women and young girls to think that something as benign as a joke or a passing comment is a sign of patriarchy and rape culture and all of uh, all of the above, everything you can think of. <laughs> Yeah, so it kind of takes vulnerable young women and um, sort of victimises them in a way, doesn't it? You know, um, like you say, it kind of weaponises their suffering and it's not trying to heal them. It's mm, trying absolutely. to take that pain that they've got and direct it towards smashing the patriarchy. Yeah, mm -hmm. and after listening to your speech, and it's something that... Um, we all kind of talk about in the men's rights movement of feminism is really, now that I've gone through CBT therapy and I'm much better at dealing with my past and dealing with um, just being able to function as a, a regular human being. Feminism just teaches mostly women, but probably also men, um, to do the complete opposite of all the like coping mechanisms mm. and he healthy uh, or healthier thinking um, that is promoted in CBT therapy, mm. feminism just flips it on its head on its head and promotes catastrophizing, mm. personalization, everything you said in your speech. And I 100% agree. I think it's I think it's cruel, actually. The the because it's saying to women that um, it's reasonable that you're hyper anxious and we, we know women are more anxious than men anyway even though they're less likely for example to, to suffer violence on the streets um but it's saying it's saying not not that you not that you as a woman or girl um you know it's 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 understandable and, and you should be kind of traumatized but the, but the solution is for the world to be changed mm. and that is just you know and it, it could not be more cruel i'm sure laura bates wouldn't see it that way um, but no. she, you know, I, I suspect, I'm no psychologist, but I suspect she, she, she had a major failure to launch. I mean, I see her, I think she's what, 35 or something. I, I, I see a 12 year old there in a woman's mm -hmm. body. And it, it is, abs it is tragic. Absolutely tragic. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I feel quite similar, like at the time, um, I was never really interested in having like a fancy career or anything like that. I was very much the type of uh, girl who wanted to focus on family. I wanted to find a good and loving husband and work if I work when and if I could. But my main focus, I always wanted to be my family and my future children. And unfortunately, I wasn't supported um, by the people around me at the time. And someone who I was very close to, a family member that I was extremely close to at the time, uh, I, when I was leaving college and, you know, everyone was kind of interesting, interested in, oh, what, what do you want to do? Do you um, do uh, what kind of career do you want to have in the future? And I really I just wanted to find something that maybe. Uh, um, and use to work part time, like I was interested, I was slightly interested in doing hairdressing. Um, just so, and uh, um, another family member, also female, um, we thought that maybe we could do a course together, um, graduate together, and maybe even have like a part-time business on the side because that was, a, a career wasn't really our main focus. I was also very interested in, um, I've always had a great love for children, and I was interested in childcare, midwifery, and that is, is still something that I would be very much um, looking into now. But at the time, when I, when I mentioned that, you know, career won't be my main focus, a very close family member kind of dumped uh, on that dream and said, 
all these kind of negative things to me and being so young, being only 16 and leaving school, I took it all to heart, you know, oh, what if, uh, what if you don't have a good husband? What if he doesn't treat you well? What if uh, he doesn't have a good job and he can't pay the bills? You'll end up like your own mum, alone on a council estate, raising children with no one to help you, with nothing uh, to show for your name. And I took it all to heart and it really, I, that, I think that really caused me to flounder a little bit. I didn't have any direction after that because I thought, well, if I can't follow my dream and society around me isn't really encouraging that either, housewives and mothers aren't, aren't uh, looked upon in the same way as they used to be. You, you know, you're seen as quite lazy if you want to stay at home with the kids. Uh, you should have a career, you should be doing X. And yeah, so I just kind of didn't do much at all until I started caring for my dad because my dad had always been a, a positive role model in my life. Uh, he wasn't perfect. My parents split up because he was abusive and had uh, alcohol problems, but he was always very loving towards me, very en encouraging in some ways, but also a bit um, critical in other ways. But I do feel like having good male role models around me helped me kind of not go too far into um, feminism. I did, I did go quite far, but I never let go of the, the, the idea of men can also be the victims of sexism. They can be on the receiving end of sexism. And that was something that helped pull me out out of it afterwards because I was reading articles from, oh, what was it, Everyday Feminism? And it said, oh, men, men can't be um, on the receiving end of sexism. And I just thought, no, no, not at all. You, ha you can't say that if, if it, it, it's, a, it's a two faces of a coin. Mm. If, if women can be judged and criticized because of the way that they are, then absolutely men can as well. Hmm. Yeah, I think. Uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, Mike. Sorry, Liz. Well, I was just going to say it's probably time for the next question. I think, oh. unless you want to. Well, I was just going to. Unless you want point to. Out, I was just going to point out that um, I think there's. So, so you've never been to university either, Michelle. No, thankfully, no, I, I actually it. think I'm quite lucky now. <laughs> I do too. And like, you know, I feel like, you know, the most people without having gone to university um, have quite simple and reasonable ideas about, you know, well, what's sexism? Sexism is when you have some kind of disaffection for someone because of their sex. But then it's like, you know, people go to university and suddenly the idea of sexism is much more complicated. It's like, no, no, it's prejudice plus power, you know, and all this. And it's, you, I just, I quite often say, you know, you have to go to university to get that stupid. <laughs> it's like sometimes, sometimes the most simple kind of understanding of a word is just what it is. Yeah. And I, I do really consider myself quite lucky that I didn't go to university. Mm -hmm. um, I did do a few years at local college um, and there were some hints of like intersectionality creeping up then. And I, I do feel like it wasn't really asking the question, it was trying to push you towards the answer that they wanted to give. Because I remember at one point during college, um, we were all together as a class and we were asked to, it's, you know, the experiment of, well, social experiment of where you all stand in a line and you, you're giving, like on a piece of paper, you're given an identity, like a uh, white man, white woman, black woman, and so on, gay man. And you take a step forward if you think that um, maybe a certain barrier wouldn't affect you or maybe take a step back if, a, if something would affect that person with their identity more. And we got to the end where 
the the options were and obviously I do think this was the the goal that they were aiming for you had the only thing the only identities left were man and woman or straight man straight woman I believe and the the last question was who do you think um if uh, if these people were up for promotion who's more likely to receive the promotion and the woman uh, the young woman in our class who was given the identity of straight woman uh, which was originally from africa and she stepped forward because she herself believed no no maybe sexism was a problem you know however many years ago but in today's day and age i don't think that it really affects uh, women at all. And I do think that women would be more, she said, I do think women would be more likely to be given a promotion. So she was way ahead of the game, yeah. um, even back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there was like pushback from the class teacher to kind of like, are you sure, really? It, you don't think it would go to the man? What about X, Y? What if she wants to have a family? Um, she'll, she'll be judged and, all, all the rest of it <laughs> but she was ahead of the game <laughs> how interesting so i'm wondering you know while you were um in feminism what kind of impact it had on your relationships well i really hate the person that i became when i was a feminist looking i honestly looking back on my behavior and the way that i treated people specifically my part my partner at the time ex partner now i i'd have to describe it as emotionally abusive i became emotionally abusive and we were codependent he was the only person helping me on a daily basis with my dad but i took out all my frustrations on him you want to take a minute <laughs> Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll edit this out, Michelle, if you want. Oh, no, it's fine. Yeah. Do, 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 do you want to have five minutes? Uh, I'll, be, I'll be able to pull myself together, but this is also another reason why I wanted to speak out, because it's, it's just... I really don't like the person that I allowed myself to become. I don't want to make any excuses for my past behaviour. Um, because I am 100% responsible for my own behaviour and my own choices. The only thing I can really say is because of circumstances that were out of my control, such as um, I didn't have a lot of support around me when caring for my dad. And we, we all became very isolated. Mm -hmm. And my poor, my poor partner at the time, he had many issues with his family and the things that he was going through. And he was probably just thinking, I need to support her because if if I don't have her, I don't have anyone else really. But I was I was awful. The behavior that that I and it's it's also very difficult for me to remember because feminine sorry, depression, uh, severe depression at the time has a great effect. Mm -hmm on um, your memory and I, I had to kind of um, look back on a few events at the time that was happening just so I could remember what was really going on in my life and in the world at the same time but I it it just it really pushes you towards destroying Ooh. your own relationships and the own your own personal connections that you have with family members, maybe your romantic relationships, uh, everything. And yeah, the, well, <laughs> just thinking off the top of my head, really. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's because um, we we do have you know we do have mental illness and depression and you know addiction and um traumas that we all have to deal with and then you know the thing is that you get feminism coming in and repainting everything as you know of course this is all happening because men are all oppressive and if you're in a vulnerable state anyway 
and then someone comes and says that you know it's quite easy to believe it I think you know I certainly had to be in a stronger better place personally before I could look at the situation between the sexes more objectively yeah mm. and it does kind of give people an external reason you know oh I can I can put the blame at the feet of society I can put the blame at the feet of patriarchy and men and it doesn't encourage people to look at their own choices, look at where they may have gone wrong. And it doesn't give them hope. It doesn't give them any kind of ability to feel like that they can change no. what's going on in their life or change. look at your own behavior, look at your own choices. And it's not to, to criticize people, it's to give them to let them know that they have the ability to change their own life and change their circumstances, pick yourself up. You do have, you do have the strength to overcome whatever it is that you, that went on in the past, or, you know, the, maybe the backgrounds that you come from is that's not your fault. You didn't choose that, but also the choices that you make now, are what are what matter and that's what I try try and focus on the most instead of beating myself up I, I can admit to uh where I want pardon me where I went wrong but I do really want to focus on improving myself and when I look back now it's I honestly didn't think that I would be able to come this far I felt hopeless I felt completely lost when I was a feminist can I just say, uh, I mean, I lied to that, Michelle. I think uh, among uh, many, many things, feminism is, is very infantilizing. It, it, I mean, um, it, stops, it stops women um, from developing moral agency, doesn't it? And yeah. Laura Bates is going to be the, the same when she's 90 years old, quite frankly. She'll be a child. <laughs> and I've, I've, know, I've known women who, you know, of 70, 80, 90, who are basically children. Um, and it's it's horrible to see, and they're miserable, um, and they still blame other people, you know, for things that happened 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. It's, it's um, it's you know, and, and feminists, of course, are the only group in the world who aim to um, make women more anxious, because mm. it drives all the feminist industries. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's absolutely shocking. Um, yeah. uh, Elizabeth, I think you asked your, your question in, in, the, in your first question, didn't you, through in that? Uh, Okay, well, I think I think I think Michelle's answered my second question. Um, we're about twenty-five minutes in, so it's it's going well. Um, let me just find my my second question. So 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 this is going to be my last question, uh, Michelle. Let me just pull that up. Okay, Michelle, one of the most exciting developments in in the men's rights movement in recent years has been the willingness of women of all ages to identify as MRAs and anti-feminists. To my surprise, it's becoming cool for women, especially young women, to identify as MRAs and anti-feminists. How do you think we might attract even more good women into the men's rights movement? It is a very good question. Um, I think the reason why a lot of women um, don't identify with feminism or have rejected it is because they they've realized that it's a it's a complete double standard it's completely hypocritical um, uh, just thinking of how we would attract more women but I think generally women are starting to wake up to the infantilization like you like you said um so just, just take on that point michelle I, I i can't help but think that that people look at women like you and elizabeth and karen strawn janice fiamengo and so on and think these are really well adjusted happy super bright people whereas flossy over there the feminist you know is is, is you know in comparison is a pretty you know repulsive figure <laughs> And, and, and I think it's almost like there's um, 
there's like you know competing herds because I, I think women are are far more the problem is whenever I talk about women in herds I, people say that am I calling women cows which I'm which, which are, <laughs> We can absolutely not, but 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 there is a social glue among women that there totally isn't among men, and and I and I think uh, you know quite, quite I think girls, never mind women, are looking and saying, well you know when I look at feminists I know, and anti-feminists and non-feminists, my God which group do I want to be associated with? And yeah. it, it's probably a complete no-brainer I would think. Yeah, and when I think of the um, non-feminist women that I know personally in my in my own life um they they do focus on their family but they also have a very kind of just pick yourself up and keep going kind of mentality and feminism is just like the complete the complete opposite it's very fragile it it causes you to become very emotionally fragile mm -hmm not being able to take any kind of criticism or um well, any criticism, kind of criticism from personal slights <laughs> so criticism from, from a man of course is misogyny isn't it <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry i, I interrupt too much so no, no, that's fine <laughs> but um i was just thinking of an example uh where after elizabeth gave her speech and we were all uh within the um, meeting and uh, participating. I don't. I don't exactly know why. I didn't see why, but um, you refer to one of the young ladies taking part as pathetic, and uh, oh, instantly offended. Instantly, re kind of moment. Oh, how dare you call a woman pathetic? And it's like, oh, yes, yes, I remember. Yes, I. I believe I know why. So I was. This was an event um, on Zoom because of COVID. Mm -hmm but with Sussex University and I was giving my speech and I had my script up on the screen so I saw nothing. But I've since been told that there was a charming young lady holding up a sign to her camera that read, pick me. <sighs> wow. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can, I, can I just add, add to that, Elizabeth? It was, no, it was, it was, a, it was, it was a wonderful thing. So, um, so, so okay, so, so she said, you know, Mike Buchanan has called some, some, somebody pathetic, this woman, young woman pathetic. And Elizabeth is a born diplomat. She has, she, has, she has the brain wiring of the ultimate diplomat. So she talked for about 30 seconds in quite sort of soothing tones without, without criticizing me, which was nice. And then, then she sort of looked to one side and said, but then again, maybe she was pathetic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it, was, it was a beautiful moment. I, I cheered, I cheered when she yeah. said that. Absolutely, because that's, that's what I thought. You know, did you ever think, did she ever think to look at her own behavior and maybe yes it is quite pathetic of of what you're what you're doing in this moment while well, someone's attempting to give a speech attempting to communicate um you just want to hold up your little sign um insulting her mm. while she's attempting to make a point yeah and even though i didn't see at all <laughs> it's quite funny now that you've explained it but even though i didn't see uh, the reason why i thought well if Mike's calling you pathetic, maybe there's a good reason why. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, I found it it's uh, quite amazing that, you know, that because the young lady who asked me the question and I didn't understand what it was about, you know, her first question was, as a woman, would I be safe in the men's human rights movement? Mm. And I was like, of course. And then she explained that it's because someone had been called pathetic. And I was like, what's safe from harsh words? Sorry, no. <laughs> yeah. You won't be safe from harsh words. But actually, you know, I would rate um, calling a woman a pick me as significantly more offensive than mm. calling a woman pathetic personally. So it's like, well, who's going to protect me from the harsh words of feminists? You know, luckily, I don't need that protection. Um, Absolutely. And uh, what was it? Um, oh, my mind's gone blank now. <laughs> I was going to okay. ask you what you think actually about one of the things that's really surprised me about the men's human rights movement is that I've found here something I never ever would have expected to and actually I expected to find in feminism, which is sisterhood. 
Mm. You know, Absolutely. with kind of you yeah. and Natty and um, Belinda and I mean, actually, there's too many women to list, but there's <laughs> so many fantastic women and we really are close knit and good friends who want the best for each other. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just remembered what it was that I wanted to say. It was because of that woman, that young woman who said, oh, would I be safe if I attended one of these meetings? I thought, I, I don't know if I was caught on camera at all, but I, I, that enraged me, honestly, it enraged me. And I wanted to, I was kind of like, me now, me, I need to speak now. <laughs> uh, it really, part of my language pissed me off. Um, how dare she uh, insinuate that she wouldn't be safe at any of these meetings? Um, how how dare how dare Laura Bates insinuate that she can link um, the the men's rights movement here in the UK to oh mass atrocities and murders and God knows what else? Oh, it, it really that's why I I have started speaking out more and why I wanted to do this interview. It's it's quite nerve wracking. But oh my God. <laughs> it's quite nerve wracking, but that's why I need to, I felt the need to speak out because of these lies and malicious allegations. Um, I have never felt comfortable anywhere in my whole life. Like you said, you, you were attracted to feminism because you thought it would be like a, a welcoming community and it absolutely wasn't at all. <laughs> it, the most welcoming community I have ever ever had the privilege of taking part in and joining is the men's rights movement everyone has been so welcoming and especially being an ex-feminist I was very um nervous maybe slightly nervous of how I would be received but I haven't received any kind of negative uh, backlash mostly people are just very interested in my thoughts and opinions have lots of questions to ask I've never felt more welcome. How lovely. What, what a ringing endorsement. <laughs> uh, you'll recall Cassie Jay's story in her film uh, that she directed, The Red Pill, of her long and painful journey from being a feminist to becoming a non-feminist after spending a lot of time with MRAs, both male and female. How, how did you personally escape feminism's clutches? Uh, well, like I, like I mentioned earlier, uh, CBT played uh, a big role, um, but also quite a few things that were going on uh, in the world and in my own personal life. Um, my father passed away in two, February 2016, and that's when I really pushed myself into CBT therapy and focusing on getting better. I had to um, find a job outside of the home for the very first time. So um, going from being isolated, agoraphobic, and having panic attacks at the mere thought of leaving the home, um, I was then pushing myself very hard uh, to find a job and support myself. And also um, in the world at the time, there were a few things that popped up that really uh, that really helped. For one, um, Milo Yiannopoulos, mm. uh, his name was going around and at the time I was still a feminist when I heard his name and I thought well he's been banned, he's, I've heard he's been banned from twi Twitter, uh, what, what is it really um, that, what, what was it that was so bad, what, he, what had he said, what had he done, but then once I looked into, once I found I was uh, very much um, watching a lot of YouTube and watching um, on social media a lot, but because I was in a bit of an echo chamber, Milo, I would describe as a slap in the face that I really needed. Um, and once I once I <coughs> once I found one video, I couldn't stop. It was like more and more and more. Um, I think he helped me find my sense of humour again, particularly laughing at myself and the stupid things that I was repeating, the stupid beliefs that I had. And then I believe it was, because I, I had to go back and jog my memory um, of the timeline. Uh, Jordan Peterson then cropped up in the media. And funnily enough, it was a trans Facebook friend 
that had first shared any information uh, that I saw about him. And uh, she agreed that, you know, with Bill C-16, you can't force people by law to refer to trans people as their preferred pronouns. You know, it, it should be, um, you know, language evolves over time mm. and it shouldn't be forced upon anybody, uh, especially by law overnight. And then once I found Jordan Peterson and I saw that video where, you know, he was very, he was surrounded by all these people that were just quite maybe emo not very emotionally stable, mm. uh, throwing a lot of accusations at him. And I could see how well he was handling the whole situation. I thought, this is amazing. How, how can he cope with, with all of this? And so then delving into one after another Jordan Peterson video, a bit of Milo, a bit of Jordan Peterson. And then after Brexit and after Trump, a lot of, I started to see a lot of uh, things that didn't, line up with what I was being told to believe. You know, if, if you voted leave, oh, you're racist. You, you don't like foreigners, you're xenophobic. But then I would, I would have people in my personal life, um, for example, a mixed race couple uh, of, you know, they're both of different races. One was white, one was mixed race, uh, black, white. And they, they were going to vote, uh, vote leave. And I was like, wait, what? How, how can you be voting leave? I've been told that people uh, who, want, who want to vote leave are racist and this, that, and the other. And, uh, oh, what was it? Then Trump's election. Um, I realized that, you know, Hillary Clinton just expected for, uh, for her anoint just to be anointed uh, oh, it was her time, her and, time. Yeah. <laughs> but I was very much I was following the US election very closely because I'd always from a young age I'd always been a fan of the US and I noticed that a lot of people were in denial of the real issues you know if you brought up anything negative about Hillary Clinton it was flipped back and then, oh but Trump this that and the other Trump 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 so we're not talking about Trump right now we're talking about Hillary and her own her own actions and what she has done. And so I wasn't under any kind of illusion that Trump will never become president. I was, I, di I did see that it could very easily happen. And, uh, and then afterwards I saw <coughs> excuses of, the excuses of, oh, the reason why Hillary Clinton didn't win is because of sexism and all this nonsense. And I thought, this is a load, this is bollocks, pardon me. <laughs> this is nonsense. And so those, those uh, events helped me, like they did shake my belief system and really helped me get to grips with reality. And, um, and, and so a lot of looking back on my own behavior, I stopped calling myself a feminist in January, 2017. But unfortunately, um, I lost a very close family member because of the change of my opinions. And I got the, I got everything that, um, that you'd expect, alt right, um, even borderline Nazi and, and stuff like this from someone I thought was extremely close to me, just a onslaught of insults and ad hominems, not listening to what I really had to say, just the usual talking points. And I thought, we're, we're close, we're, we're, we're basically family. But now it's a complete 180. And unfortunately, since then, I don't have any contact with them. And that was quite heartbreaking, but well, it, it, it was also almost, a sad place. It's almost like, you know, whatever politics she's influenced by um, have encouraged her into black and white thinking. Or mm, yeah. uh, it's a man. Uh, oh, a man, man. sorry. <laughs> well, that's that's even worse. Wow. Can I, can, can I just go back to the issue of uh, humour and so on? Because mm. to my mind, having a good, good sense of humour is the greatest stress buster in life. Mm. If, you, if you can laugh at the things. Uh, and um, I mean, I mean, feminists, of course, are famously uh, miserable, aren't they? Um, 
Uh, even feminist comedians, you always know. Where, where, well, if a woman's described as comedian, you you always know she's going to be awful. And I, I, I've been on a number of radio things in which, and I've seen a few um, with Kate Smurth Smurthwaite. Oh, uh, you um, lucky boy! I, 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 <laughs> I, I, um, I had a broken leg once, and that was funnier than uh, Kate Smithwright. But she, she, I mean, Milo Yiannopoulos. I mean, Milo was probably the most famous one. I think he called her Darling or something, or Sweetheart. And she yes. just exploded. And, um, and, and I was on BBC Radio Ulster, and somebody said, said, uh, look, look, Darling, God gave you um, one mouth and two ears. Bit of a clue there, love. You might want to dwell on that. And, and she went crazy again. She, yeah. She has had like five years to come up with a humorous riposte to people who call her darling or toots. She's, she's, in five years, she hasn't come up with one. <laughs> it's, um, you know, so some, yeah. Someone really should set up a website um, you know, dedicated to laughing at feminists. Yeah, yeah. If, if, any, if any someone that, would that do was, that. Uh, that was actually something that really helped. Um, I started watching, after Milo, I started watching a lot of feminist cringe videos and absolutely wetting myself and laughing at the way that I had behaved and that, laughing at yourself really gives you a better perspective and when I was younger um, I had a family member who encouraged me to be slightly offensive and slightly you know don't really give a f about uh, people's opinions or if they're offended by jokes you know uh, shows like South Park and right. Beavis and Butthead and all that kind of offensive comedy and humor um, I was introduced to from a young age and I thought it was quite interesting how this person suddenly flipped and now they are the ones saying, no, this is offensive, that's offensive, you can't say this and you can't say that. It's like, years ago, you were saying the complete opposite. What happened? Yeah, yeah. Good, I, I, um, I, um, I think, Elizabeth, do, do you want to sort of uh, do the outro? Certainly. Well, this has been a very pleasant conversation, Michelle. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us. I look forward to working with you in the future. That's a wrap. Thank you so much. Thank it's you, not Michelle. Really. Oh.